Every day, over 150,000 deaths occur worldwide. All people of all ages have to face this devastating truth at some point in their life. Death's door comes to young and old, rich and poor. Death is no respecter of persons. Many people who face this reality never thought it would be their time to go. When someone dies, the Bible teaches clearly throughout that a person's soul goes on to a judgment. Every religion believes and holds to the thought of an afterlife. Most people in these religions think that they can merit salvation by how good they are, the rituals they practice, their baptism, how often they attend church. Throughout the scriptures we find that the concept of salvation has never changed. Through this film we will discover that Jesus, the apostles, and the prophets taught that salvation is by faith and faith alone. We will see that there are only two concepts of religion. People either believe in a faith-based salvation or a works-based salvation. We are about to set out on a journey to see how salvation is applied, how eternal life is given, and if it truly is by faith alone. Afghanistan has been going on so long now that many of the men and women fighting it were still in grade school when it started. The war has receded into the background for many Americans preoccupied with daily life and caught up in other news, lingering high unemployment, the disaster in the Gulf. But nine years in, this war has now hit a new level of ferocity as U.S. forces meet the Taliban head on and casualties now. Salvation belongeth to the Lord. So it's His from start to finish. Salvation really is a love story from Genesis to Revelation. Genesis opens up with Adam and Eve, a husband and a wife, a love scene. And it ends in Revelation with the words, and the spirit and the bride say come. So before the foundation of the world, that's the Bible words, God had a plan. And it was in that plan that he created salvation. So salvation is the reason for everything. Salvation is the reason for creation. Salvation is the reason even for the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So before the foundation of the world, the Godhead, as the Bible calls it, uh, was perfect and had needed need of nothing. God decided that he wanted to have an everlasting love a bride, if you will. And this is where the plan of salvation came from. It came from the heart of God. And so when the Bible says, uh, when Jesus said that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he was talking about an eternal plan that started from before the creation. 
and Jesus was the fulfillment of that plan. When God created the world, He didn't create it for people to just be worried about their salvation and never come to an understanding of whether they're going to go to heaven or hell when they die. When God created salvation and created this world, He wanted everybody to be able to understand salvation and be able to have a chance to receive Him as Savior. We're justified by, by faith alone. Um, so many people trying to work their way to heaven. but. Why did Christ come and die on the cross? He came to die on the cross to save man from their sin. And if we could justify ourselves through works or we could somehow earn God's favor, uh, his death on the cross would have not been necessary. So we're justified truly by trusting in Christ alone. It's very, very clear, very, very clear that the apostles themselves were arguing this, you don't need anything other than grace. You don't need anything other than faith in Jesus Christ. It says, but these are written, that's, he's telling you why the book of John is written, that ye might believe, there's that word, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, there it is again, he might have life through his name. You know that word believes in the Gospel of John 90 times? And that's the book that tells you how to be saved? And in Romans, it's not works that we're justified by, it's faith that we're justified by before God. If you believe in your heart, in, in Christ as your Savior, His shed blood, and whether you have a big, long, elaborate prayer, or just, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't have to be anywhere near a church to be saved. That has nothing whatsoever to do with a physical building or a denomination or any lineage of pastors, priests, rabbis, or anyone. I do remember as a boy, I made a deal with my mom and dad, if I make half the price of this bicycle, could you pay the other half? And they agreed with that. That wasn't a gift. I had to work for it. But a gift is something that you receive. It's not something that you earn. It is a gift of God, not of works. That was the key. That was the key to everything. You know, people don't need their good works. Good works are wonderful and Christians should be producing fruit and doing good works, but it isn't going to do anything to get them to heaven. The only thing is through the bloodshed of Christ. And what sets us apart from every, when I say every, I mean every religion out there, is that we believe not in a due religion, but in a done Christianity, in a done faith. Christ did everything for us to get us to heaven and we simply have to put our faith and trust in his finished work on the cross. Of course, there's the true gospel, but there also are many pseudo-gospels. Just change one little element of the gospel. Take away the deity of Christ. Make Jesus a man who became God rather than God who became man. Change salvation to be faith plus something, and you have another gospel. And so there are a lot of other gospels out there, and of course, many of the cults present skewed views of the gospel. They are immersed into that baptismal pool, and then as they come out of the pool, they're anointed with oil 
Uh, and so that's uh, kind of like that sign of that's kind of like that moment where they get saved, you might say. Well, that that, that is, 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 is it's like it's like the moment that brings it to completion. Ultimately, we don't know who is going to be in heaven and who is not going to be heaven. What we can do and what we're told as Muslims is to be good and do good. What is a Mormon perspective of, of um, salvation? Um, what, what is that step that somebody needs to take to kind of enter into God's presence from a salific standpoint? Baptizing them. And uh, it, we're commanded to be baptized. So baptism is a sacrament that allows us to enter uh, his faith. And then there comes the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. Through these rituals of initiation, water baptism, uh, uh, anointing, being sealed with the Spirit. So, so to kind of gain, uh, gain a spot in the world to come, you need to live a good life, you know, kind of be an overall good person in the sense of keeping the commandments of God and, mm -hmm. and following Him. It goes according to our actions. So if a person wants to sort of get paid, he has to do the work. Not to curse your Creator. Not to murder. Not to steal not to eat any limb or part of a limb that came off an animal while it was still alive. So baptism is kind of that, that moment of where salvation comes to like a completion, I take it. Well, it, it's, the, it's the entry, it's the way you enter in, and, and then we have to keep going on. What are some of the determining factors when somebody stands before God? Uh, what are some of the determining factors that God would look at to let them in? Sure, well, I mentioned one of them there. Did we feed the hungry? Did we clothe the naked? Did we uh, welcome the stranger? Did we visit the one in prison? Throughout, Scripture talks about our deeds. Uh, our deeds matter. In Islam, we have uh, some principles for a person worthy of entering into paradise. Every good deed has a weight, has a reward, and we believe in that. We actually believe there are scales. We don't know the description of the scales. We see scales in this world, but what? Scales can be even electronically in scale nowadays, you know, technology. So how would you scale the actions of a believer, men and women? So every good deed has a weight. So, so by keeping those laws as a Gentile, that kind of guarantees their spot in the world to come. Correct. Once you've entered in by baptism, is it done? No, it's not done. You have to press forward and endure to the end. That's one way, uh, but it's not the only way. The other step is anointing, uh, uh, and it's, it's like an immersion into the mystery of the Spirit. Keep on the, the path, you know, keep going. Keep, did they feed the hungry? Did they clothe the naked? Did they give drink to the thirsty? Did they uh, visit the sick? The person that's not the Jewish only has to follow the seven Noahide laws. And, and then we have to keep going on. Through these rituals of initiation. Every good deed has a way. Water baptism, uh, uh, anointing. If the person wants to get paid, he has to do the work. All religions in the world really come down to some sort of working out of your salvation by some set of rules, by some set of understandings, uh, and they all are different from the gospel, from the true biblical Christian uh, faith in that we only just look to Jesus for our salvation. So really, all religions come down to really two things, doing or done and Jesus said on the cross it's finished it was done my salvation was was bought it was purchased God owes us nothing <laughs> he's done everything he needs to do for us and that's 
sending his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross so that we can believe on him, place our faith on him. The word grace again means unmerited favor. God gave us, it's a gift from God, salvation. And so when people wanna, wanna say that I'll be a good person, I can do these things, I can, I can be religious enough, I can trust in my baptism, whatever it may be that they're trusting in, if, it's, if they're not trusting in Christ alone, then they're, then they're saying God owes me. But when we trust it by faith in Jesus Christ alone, hey, we understand we're debtors before God. Maybe that time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Today is that day. If you, if you feel God calling, you feel that emptiness inside, or maybe you just have just always wondered, what is this Jesus thing? Who is God? I don't, I don't understand this. Does he even exist? Well, of course he does. Today is the day. Now is the time. You know, he says, you shall be saved. He says, you believe on Christ, you're saved. But the reality is, is that God saves us from our sin. Our sin is condemning. And we can try to be good, we can try to be religious, we can try to do good deeds. But n none of these things, none of these repetitious forms of religion can really remove us from our sins. Only the power of the gospel, only the power of the blood of Christ can wash away our sins. Keep on the, the path, you know, keep going. Keep, did they feed the hungry? Did they clothe the naked? Did they give drink to the thirsty? Did they uh, visit the sick and the imprisoned? And then we have to keep going on. Through these rituals of initiation. Every good deed has a way. Water baptism, uh, uh, anointing. If a person wants to get paid, he has to do the work. The Bible says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So it's very clear that once you're saved, the Bible says that you're sealed unto the day of redemption. If you're sealed, that means, you know, for the ladies out there that cook or the different people that can cook stuff up and then can it, they'll take this, uh, something that's precious to them, which your soul is very precious to the Lord, They'll take something that's precious to them, food that they want to preserve, they'll put it in a ball jar, they take in a, they, they heat it to a certain temperature, they put the product in the ball jar that's clean, it's sterile, and then they uh, kind of like the, the Lord's hand, you know, put it in that jar and they, take, they put this lid on it uh, over the product, uh, whatever, if it's peas or beans or corn or beets or whatever, uh, you know, is in that. And they put this, this little can lid on there and it goes, sucks in in the middle and it seals and you know what that stuff stays good for years and years and years and years. don't go bad the only time it goes bad is if the seal goes pop and then that stuff will rot in there if it didn't seal properly then you got troubles who's doing the sealing how much did you mean to Christ he puts you in that hand. He puts you in that jar. He sealed you with that Holy Spirit of promise. You're sealed. But if you're sealed by Him, you think He's going to make any mistakes? You think He's going to seal you good or you think His seal might break? Or you could be in there and say, I don't want to go where He's at. I'm going to bust the seal and get out. You're going to bust. You're going to, you're going to open. You're going to unseal something He sealed you in? When we trust in Christ, we, we believe in Christ as our Savior, the eternal gift of God is given to us. The seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit is given to us. Do 
Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, where the Bible says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it <laughs> until the day of Jesus Christ. So how long is he going to perform your salvation? He's the one who began it, and he'll perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. That's God's perseverance. We are kept by the power of God. Our, our eternal security, our eternal life does not depend on us. It depends wholly on the promises of God in the scripture. And at the end of the day, I have to rest in those promises. I have to rest in John chapter 10, uh, verses 28 and 29 that say that no man shall be able to pluck them out of Jesus' hand, let alone the Father's hand. Uh, it's such a great passage to think about that my salvation rests entirely in Jesus and his word at all times. What shall separate us from the love of God? What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Can we sin enough to separate us from the love of Christ? Can we negate what the, what the cross did for us? And the answer is no. Paul says, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, that means even ourselves, cannot separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Everything was done for us on the cross. There's nothing that we did to get saved. There's nothing we can do to keep ourselves saved. And there's absolutely nothing we can do to even break that covenant. There's nothing we can do to undo that covenant. So if it's everlasting, that means it cannot end. And so once a person's truly been saved, they can't lose their salvation. Uh, we, are, we are saved by grace and by the power of God. And the Bible tells us that we are kept by his power. And so uh, for us to try to uh, somehow God give us a free gift and then take it away from us because we've, we've sinned, well, we're going to fall short. When is the... When do we cross that line where, okay, I'm saved here, but I, now I've sinned, and where is that, that uh, point in my life that I lose my salvation? The Bible's very clear about when we get saved by trusting in Jesus Christ, but the Bible says nothing about, oh, at this point you lose what I have given you, the free gift that I have given you. So um, the Word of God is, uh, teaches us that once we're saved, uh, we are in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, we're in the hand of the Father and no man can pluck us out of his hand. So once we're, we've been born into the family of God, uh, we can't get kicked out. And I thank the Lord for that. We are his. And he says nothing is able to separate us from his love. We belong to Christ. So that's God's promise. Jesus said in John 6, 47, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So if I have everlasting life today, and it ends tomorrow, that's not everlasting. So when Jesus said, hey, you have everlasting life today, the moment you believe on me, and it lasts for 10 minutes, that's not everlasting. When he said it's everlasting, he meant it. That's why the Bible says, and this is the promise that God had promised us, even eternal life. It's a promise of God. So when somebody says, well, it can just end whenever, they're calling God a liar. They're saying, well, God really hasn't given us eternal life. He's just given us life until we mess up. But the Bible teaches all throughout that God has given us eternal life. Because he loves us that much. Uh, and he wanted that cross knowing what he was going through for you and I. It's, it's exciting to know how much he loves us. For God so loved the world, we know this scripture, but do we understand what he went through for us? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life, not ever stopping life or ever ceasing life.
death really is a door that everyone has to walk through in order to experience the kingdom of God. God's ultimate kingdom is not something that's experienced in the flesh. It's something that's experienced in the spirit. So people can be spiritually alive and spiritually born, Jesus said born again, uh, of the spirit, not of the flesh. And people that are spiritually born uh, live everlasting from that point. And so even though right now uh, I'm, I'm uh, physically alive, I'm also spiritually everlasting alive. I don't have to wait till I'm dead to have that. I have that now. And so what that does is that takes away the sting of death. It takes away the fear of the grave. And if I were talking to someone that were facing death, and, and, I, and, I, and I do that just about every day as a pastor, talk to someone about death, and I've been with people as they've passed over from life unto death, and there's a difference when people understand that God loves them, that they're going to his kingdom, that there's an everlasting covenant, that there's a real relationship that even death cannot break. It gives them hope, yea, even an excitement, so that they can close their eyes with peace. And I've been with people when uh, the light of everlasting life has, has shined and they've what we call crossed over that river. I've been with them. And when you're with someone that has that hope, well, I'll tell you what, it just takes away all the fear of death.
Sally, what is that step that somebody has to take in Jehovah's Witness to, to enter into salvation? Is salvation something they ever talk about? What What are your thoughts? They don't usually talk about salvation. It's not a word that they usually use. They'll talk about, um, we have to continue faithful to the end. We have to work hard for salvation. That's a, a key phrase. It's a cult phrase they use over and over again. We have to work hard for salvation. They know that they have to work hard. There is no salvation in the Jehovah's Witnesses. There is none. You're constantly on probation. You have to study with them for six months. You have to go door to door. You have to attend all the meetings. You have to answer a hundred plus questions to be baptized. You have to be baptized. You have to continue going door to door, attending all meetings until Armageddon or death, whichever comes first. You have to continue going door to door and attending all meetings for the thousand year reign of Christ. If you mess up in year 999, you'll be slaughtered by God. And then you have to continue faithful while Satan is let loose for a little while and only then are you saved? So it's prob it's constant probation. There is no salvation in, in the Watchtower, in Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't believe in it. All the cults that we've interviewed have all come out and said that you can lose your salvation, that if you're not walking just a certain way before God, that God is going to take away your salvation. In the Jehovah's Witnesses, is that something that they believe as well? Oh yeah, they are absolutely terrified of any little mistake they, they make. I remember I was going out door to door with two friends of mine, and one said to the other one, oh, do you think we'll be saved through Armageddon? And the other one said, oh, I don't know. And the other one said, oh, I hope we're doing enough. And she goes, oh, I don't know, but I'm trying. I'm trying the best I can, I hope so. You're terrified, absolutely terrified that they're gonna be destroyed at Armageddon. No matter how much they do, it's not enough. The minute you start preaching about Jesus, they get very angry and they'll say, but what about Jehovah? Like you're being uh, unfaithful to God by putting any attention on Jesus who died for us <laughs> and gave us eternal life. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the Son hath life, but he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know 100%. He didn't say, these things have I written unto you that ye may hope or that you may think, or that you may, you know, just get the idea that you might go. No, he says you can know that you have eternal life. He says it's a promise. He says it's not just something that you can think about or just meditate on. Oh, I really hope that I'm going to heaven. We talk to so many people. They say, oh, I'm just hoping that God will save me. No, God can save you. He can. Jude writes, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. If it were possible for us to fall or to fail or to lose our salvation, then we would lose our salvation. The Bible says that it's not possible. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. He is able not only to save us to the uttermost, but to keep us. When he was on the cross, all of our sins were yet future. And so he saw and knew all of our sins, past, present, and future, and he saved us from all of our sins, past, present, and future. We can't sin ourselves out of salvation. Salvation covers us by the blood of Christ forever. Jesus said in John 5, 24, he says, Verily, Verily I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Folks, listen, you can't read 
how you are possessed by the Lord Jesus Christ. You belong to him. He's passed you from death unto life and somehow come up with some idea that he'll pass you from life unto death and you're no longer his possession. For whosoever, Romans 10, 13, shall call upon the name of the Lord, that's believing those things, shall be saved. Not hope so, not I, I want to be, not I, I think I might be. But if you believe those things, you believe he's God, you believe he, he lived a 33-year perfect life, he died, he buried, he was rose again, he rose himself again. I mean, 500 people saw it at one time, 5,000 people saw it later on. It shook up history so much that they stopped the clock and started it back over again. And that's why you're in the, in the year 2017 AD. Animus Domini, after the death of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. People that really have it, they really get saved. The Bible teaches us that they'll never perish. They have everlasting life. They have eternal life. And uh, no man can pluck them out of my hand, Jesus says in John chapter 10. If you hear his word and you believe on God, if you believe on Christ, the Bible says that you've been passed from death unto life and that you have everlasting life, present tense. He doesn't say that you'll, you will get everlasting life, like you gotta wait so you get to heaven to find out. Or like you had everlasting life, past tense, like you lost it. No, he says, the moment you believe on me, he says, you have everlasting life. When God made his covenant with Abraham in the Old Testament, uh, Abraham was asleep. He awoke and he saw the Lord crossing the animal sacrifice that was there crossing that line of blood. In other words, the Lord was making a covenant with himself that we call the Abrahamic covenant. And you can't break a covenant with God that he makes with himself. And this is really what Christ did on the cross. He made a covenant with himself. God and Christ had, had struck a deal and Christ paid for all of our sins. He purchased our way into heaven. And there's nothing we, we did to make that happen. And there's nothing we do when we receive that uh, to keep it and there's nothing really that we can do to, to undo it as well. And so when that covenant is cut, salvation is everlasting and eternal. Those words are throughout uh, the words of Christ and throughout the New Testament. Our salvation is everlasting and it's eternal. Everybody knows John 3.16, but verse 14, Jesus has given a Sunday school lesson about the Jews of old in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. And he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now Jesus was talking to the Jews and he was giving them a, a, a lesson from Moses that they all knew. And this is a great Sunday school lesson, if you will, from, from the Lord Jesus. And so the story is this, that the people of Israel had left Egypt, they were in the wilderness, and they were complaining about God's provision in the desert. It was tough going. Now they should have been praising God for their salvation from Egypt, but they were complaining. And so God sent little fiery serpents into the camp. And these little fiery serpents were very potent, full of poison. And when they bit the people, the people were burning up with the venom. They were full of poison, and they were surely going to die. And Moses interceded, and God said, Moses, I want you to make a brazen serpent and put it up on a pole. I want you to raise that pole up amongst the dying in the camp. And they were crying out in pain. And if they'll just come out and look, they'll be healed and they'll live. So looking is just something that you do by faith. It's not a work, it's just a simple thing. It's not, it's not even your, your hands, it's not your feet, it's just your eyes, it's just a look. I'm sick, I'm full of poison, I'm going to die. If men would just realize I'm a sinner and I'm lost and there's nothing I can do about it, and if they would just look, they would live. 
The Bible says that you have to have the shedding of blood for the remission of sins. The wages of sin is death. And so in order to be forgiven by God, you have to have a substitute. You have to have somebody that would take your place. There's no other person in the world that could do that except for Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 16 is a, is a great passage of scripture. It talks about a, a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul. Paul and Silas are on a missionary journey and he's preaching the gospel of Christ and ends up in jail. While he was in jail, he was beaten, he was put in stocks, him and Silas. And the Bible tells us at midnight, they broke into song, they broke into prayer, and they just had themselves a celebration in jail. And the Bible tells us that the stocks fell off, the prison was shaken, the doors were open, and the jailer that was in charge of taking care of them and making sure that they didn't escape. Thought that they had all the prisoners had, had gotten free. And he was going to kill himself and Paul came out. He said, do thyself no harm. We're all still here. And he came in to see them and he asked the greatest question ever asked in the Word of God. He said, what must I do to be saved? And the Apostle Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Paul didn't tell him you need to join the church. He didn't tell him you need to be baptized. He didn't tell him you need to be a good person. He didn't tell him you need to set us free and maybe you'll make it into heaven. Maybe you'll get eternal life. He said, no, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I would tell somebody who's about to die, and I've done this in hospitals, speaking to people who are on their deathbed, I remember a lady here about a month ago, I, I, she was in hospice house, and I knelt by her bed and I asked her to squeeze my hand if she could hear me, and she squeezed my hand. And I gave her the plan of salvation through the book of Romans, and I asked her to squeeze my hand if she heard that, she said yes. And I said, would you like to receive Christ as your Savior? Is there any reason you wouldn't want to pray right now and get this settled before you leave this world? If you'd like to pray, squeeze my hand, she squeezed my hand. And we prayed together and she couldn't talk, but she had her eyes wide open. And then we got done with the prayer. I said, did you pray that prayer? And you meant it with your heart, squeeze my hand. She did. One hour later, that dear lady went out into eternity knowing Christ as her savior. You understand that before she died, she was troubled. Before I talked to her, she was troubled. Her family told me she, she's troubled. She's groaning and moaning and she's, she's really hurting and she's really troubled. After we prayed together, peace for one hour and she went out to be at peace with God into eternity. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. It's a gift of God. <laughs> it can't get any better than that. It's eternal because He's eternal. He's the beginning and the ending of our faith. And He's never going to give up on us. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Notice that it says it's the washing of regeneration. When you get saved, the Bible says you've been regened, meaning that you have God's genes running through you. His DNA is inside of you. Just as we all have an earthly father, it's clear that once you're born into your earthly father's family, that there's nothing you can do to take his genetics out of you. The same thing goes with our Heavenly Father. Once you're born into His family, there's nothing you can do to remove those genes. That's why the Bible says that nothing shall separate us from the love of God. This is a passage of scripture talking about those who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
They have trusted him. They've placed their faith in him. They've believed on him. They've been born into the family of God. And they become a member of God's family. And God is a faithful father. And in this passage, it, it compares a, a heavenly father, our, our heavenly father, to an earthly father who chastens or punishes their children when they do wrong. Are they still their children? Absolutely. Um, are we still God's children when we do wrong? Absolutely. We live for Christ because we're saved, not to get saved. We don't earn our salvation. But as we work on our relationship with our Father, there's going to be times where uh, we may do wrong. And we need to repent for that and get right. But if we refuse to get right and we know we're wrong, then God has to chasten us, just like any father would a child in his own family. He had to go to the cross. He despised the shame. He went to the cross. He willingly died for you. He willingly died for me. He died for the sins of the whole world. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everyone to be saved. Everyone. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He knows how terrible hell is. He went there, got the keys to death and hell, and rose the third day. Anyone that goes to hell goes past Jesus. I can imagine he'll hold those keys and say, I died for you. I paid for it for you. You didn't have to go. Why didn't you just trust me? I've, I talk to people a lot, and I tell them, look, if you put your faith and trust in Christ, he'll never tell you no. He wants us to come naked, just as we are, without one plea. It's Jesus Christ. He will set, he will make us free. Suffer the little children to come unto me. According to your custom, at this time of year, one prisoner shall be released. Barabbas. Free Barabbas. Than with Jesus, who is called the Christ. Crucify you. He went to the cross. They whipped him with a cat of nine tails. They tore his flesh right off his body. The Bible says you couldn't even tell he was a man. His visage was so marred. They took and they ripped his beard out. They spit in his face. Yet he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But he loved you so much that he died for you in your place. So torn, so marred. They put him, they nailed him through, right here, through the bottom of the hands and through the feet. They put him on a cross. You could have, if you would have been there that day, you could have heard Christ breathing. You would have looked at him, seen the blood rolling down, seen the sweat rolling down. The kinds of pain that he went through, he endured for us, but he did so, he did so voluntarily. And 
he would he would do it if just for you he would do it but he did it for you and for me and for the entire world it's always been by faith alone i mean if god if god if god says i change not i'm not going to change and right from the beginning of time right after adam and eve were created right after all that happened after the fall after everything happened god said there has to be a substitute there has to be a lamb you know when i think about christ and his sacrifice and everything he's done you know the saddest part of calvary it wasn't the the beating that was terrible the saddest part of Calvary wasn't the whips that tore his flesh. The saddest part of Calvary wasn't even his disciples rejecting him. You know, saying, I don't know that man. That wasn't it. The saddest part of Calvary was when he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The saddest part of Calvary was when God the Father had to turn his back on his only son. And for the first time in all eternity, they were separated. I always used to tell my boys when they would get caught, when they did something wrong, I'd say, isn't that great? And they'd look at me, what do you mean? What's so great about that? It just shows that your Heavenly Father loves you and He's chasing you and He's making sure that you keep your heart right with Him. Even to this day, 36 years later, when I hear the Gospel and it's, there's such a spirit about it, I get emotional. I do the same thing at a wedding, by the way. It might sound funny. I do cry at weddings because it's a picture of the Gospel. If I was the only person in the world, he'd come, just for me. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Death really is a door that everyone has to walk through in order to experience the kingdom of God. God's ultimate kingdom is not something that's experienced in the flesh. It's something that's experienced in the spirit. And people that are spiritually born uh, live everlasting from that point. And so even though right now uh, I'm, I'm uh, physically alive, I'm also spiritually everlasting alive. I don't have to wait till I'm dead to have that. I have that now. And so what that does is that takes away the sting of death. It takes away the fear of the grave. And if I were talking to someone that were facing death, and I do that just about every day as a pastor, talk to someone about death, and I've been with people as they've passed over from life unto death, and there's a difference when people understand that God loves them, that they're going to his kingdom, that there's an everlasting covenant, that there's a real relationship that even death cannot break. It gives them hope, yea, even an excitement, so that they can close their eyes with peace. And I've been with people when uh, the light of everlasting life has, has shined and they've, what we call, crossed over that river. I've been with them. And when you're with someone that has that hope, well, I'll tell you what, it just takes away all the fear of death.
first thing to even know if you're going to heaven is to recognize that you have a need. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's important for us to realize the exceeding sinfulness of our sinful nature and of the sins that we commit. Sin, John says in 1 John, is the transgression of the law of God. If you break one of the commandments, You've broken all of the commandments, and all of us are guilty. Proverbs 21 says, "In high look and a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Uh, Romans 14, 23, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The Bible's full of these definitions. The Bible also says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. So the payment, wages means payment. So when I go to my job, I earn wages. It's called payment. It's the same thing. Well, unfortunately, the wages of sin is death. Our payment for our sin means that one day we'll have to die. And unfortunately, the Bible goes a step further in the book of Revelation. And it says that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And it says that this is the second death. And so one of the reasons that I mention this is because I don't want anybody to have to go through the second death. But I love the next part of Romans 6.23. It says, obviously for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, the Bible says that he was God manifest in the flesh. He was basically God with skin on. That was his mission. That was why he came to earth was to die for the sins of man. 
He was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. And he came and fulfilled that mission and went to the cross. The Bible says that while he was on that cross, that he himself bare our sins in his own body. So every sin I've ever done and every sin that anybody else has ever done was put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So to be saved from that, Paul tells the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all he said. He didn't say you had to, you had to become a religious person. He said, believe. And that's what people today, this is still the same message. What must I do to be saved from the penalty of my sin? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Again, it's by placing our faith in what Christ did on the cross to pay for our sin debt that gets us into heaven. It was done. My salvation was, was bought. It was purchased. And Christ is alive today. I don't, I don't uh, believe in and, and serve a martyr because he died, he was buried, but he rose the third day. He's alive. He showed himself alive by many infallible proofs, the Bible says. And then he ascended back into heaven. And when he ascended, the angel said that he's going to come again the same way. So when you're saved, you believe in a living Savior who is on his way back as he promised he's coming again. You are given a gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. When you get a gift from a father, from a son, from an aunt or uncle, they give you the gift. There's nothing tied to that gift. It's free. All you have to do is receive that gift. That's what God gave us through Jesus. The Bible says that the moment that you trust Christ and put your faith in Him, that you're saved and you're sealed and you're kept by His power to the day of redemption. He also says that there's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. If you want something, if you want a gift, typically you would ask for it. If you'd like to repeat this prayer after me and receive that gift from Christ and just make sure that you're saved by asking Him to save you, I'd be more than glad to lead you in a prayer. I would pray something like this. 